Uh, welcome back to the New Life Online Bible School. Uh, and today we are starting uh, the school of the uh, pastor. We have had uh, four sessions with the school of the apostle and uh, two with the school of the prophet uh, until now, and uh, two or three at least. Um, and uh, now we are starting with the pastor. So, um, and uh, um, of course, the pastor is probably the one uh, ministry gift that is the most known uh, or common or yeah, accepted and so on. Um, but it is also the most, um, the, the ministry gift that we misunderstand the most and have most uh, uh, wrong thoughts about, <laughs> to just uh, say it straight away. Um, so, uh, uh, and um, so hopefully we're going to straight up some of those uh, those things uh, and um, and uh, in the process not uh, um, anger too many of you <laughs> hopefully um, but uh, uh, at least we're going to see what the word of God says and uh, of course there is a lot of uh, uh, traditions uh, and traditions of men mostly uh, that have uh, have affected our view of the pastor and therefore often I do not like to to use the word pastor because instantly we get a picture in our head which uh, 80 or 90 percent of is wrong uh, and and so better word in this is a shepherd because that is the word that the the the, the bible use if you if you read uh, in any uh, bible that is is not like uh, uh, have have this this mindset that we have to use pastor uh, because you cannot actually find the word pastor in any bible uh, except for the Latin one, because it's a Latin word. So why we suddenly should use a Latin word in a Norwegian or English Bible, it's beyond me, because the word in Greek is not pastor, uh, it's, it's something else. So, but this we're going to look at later on. But anyway, what we're going to talk about today is the shepherd's heart. And, uh, or... or the pastor's heart, uh, and uh, uh, because this is the most important part of the of the shepherd of the pastor, uh, the the heart of the 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 pastor, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, so so yeah, we're gonna go into this and uh, see if we uh, we. Uh, Get something out of, out of it for you. Okay, so so what we're going to talk about is the shepherd's heart, and let's start. So, how to become a pastor? Uh, that is, of course, uh, a good question, and probably a lot of people have asked themselves that. How on earth shall I become a pastor? Uh, and, and, and maybe it's because they, they have a a longing to become a pastor or, or they have a calling to become a pastor. And of course, if you have a calling to become a pastor, then it's uh, quite a legitimate uh, question to ask. Uh, but of course, if it's just an ambition to become a pastor, then it's not so legitimate. Uh, but uh, so how on earth shall you become a pastor? Well, first of all, you need to have a calling. Uh, and uh, let's go to John uh, John 21, and um, and we look at uh, this from the word, and word 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, feed my lambs. 
He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Okay, here we find uh, when, when Jesus is coming to Peter and he is uh, reaffirming or, or uh, redoing the calling that he gave to Peter. You know, uh, if you read the Gospels, uh, Matthew, for instance, you'll find that in the, in the, quite in the beginning of the Gospel, uh, you'll find that Jesus comes and, and, and Simon is there with his bows and so on, and Jesus said to him, follow me. And he joins him. He leaves the boat and, and the fishing nets and everything and, and follows Jesus. And that is, is, of course, the original calling. But here Jesus is coming and he is redoing it in a way. Because, you know, in between here, Peter have, you know, fallen in when, when, you know, when he gets the answer, uh, he gets the questions if he is one of the those that knows Jesus, you know, when Jesus is caught and, and, and he, he uh, uh, rejects uh, that he is, is with Jesus, you know. He, he says, no, I'm not, I do not know this man and so on, and he's even swearing on it. So, so he's like, and, and Jesus, he, he comes and asks him three times, do you love me? And then he's like, you know, he had, had rejected uh, Jesus three times, and, and Jesus comes three times and asks him, you love me. So this is like, uh, you know, uh, Jesus restoring uh, the, the calling and, and everything for, for Peter. But it is also uh, when Jesus is giving him the responsibility as the shepherd of this, the, the, the church in a way. Uh, and, and the church here is not big. It's uh, 120 people. Uh, and, and, you know, when Jesus is caught up to heaven, they start instantly a prayer meeting for 10 days in the upper room. And, and, this, this, uh, and often we say that the church was born on Pentecost, but that is not wrong. That, that is, is, is wrong in a way because actually it, it started a little bit earlier, 10 days earlier, the church there, 120 people gathering in prayer. But then, of course, on Pentecost, they get the Holy Spirit and they are multitude, uh, they are, are multiplied by these uh, 3,000, you know, that comes uh, and are getting into the church. So, so here we, 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 um, we have the calling of the pastor, in a way. So Jesus is, is saying to, to Peter here how to become a pastor, how to become a shepherd. Uh, and... Uh, and the three things that he is saying here is that feed my sheep, uh, feed my, my lambs, you know, feed the newborns, those that are, are just saved, you know, you shall feed them. And then tend my sheep, and that is protecting and, and leading and so on, the sheep, and then feed my sheep. So, so this is more or less the calling of the pastor in, in, a, in a nutshell. So, and, and of course, to become a pastor, you need to have a calling from Jesus. And, and let's go to 1 Timothy 3. And we read from one, verse 1 there. This is a faithful saying... If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Or, or, um, and and uh, uh, a bishop is said in this one, but uh, an elder, it says often, is, is, the, is the word um, uh, episkopos. Uh, and and in, in the Norwegian Bible, it says elder. Uh, and uh, here it said bishop. But this is, you know, 
it's uh, 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 one that is, is overseeing. Uh, and, uh, and here it says that if you desire this, it's a good thing that you are desiring. But you know, it's, it, you need more than just the desire to become something in the kingdom of God when it comes to the ministry gift. Uh, God is the one that is creating in us the desire to do his will. It says in Philippians that he all, both dis make us desire it, but also be able to do it. So, so, so uh, and that is, is the work of God. He puts in this desire. But, if, but the desire needs to be of God. It needs to be something that he puts in us and not our ambition. You know, if, if it's just you wanting, wanting to get a, a good job or uh, uh, get some status, uh, status in, you know, in, in the church, you, you, you long for the recognition or something like that, then that desire is not of God. That is of the flesh. And, and so, so you need to, you know, scrutinize your motives. You need to see, look into yourself. Why am I desiring this? What is my end goal here? What, what, what do I long for here, actually? So if, if it's a, but Paul says here, if you desire this, it's a good thing. Uh, but that desire should be a holy desire. Because it says in John 10, John 10 and verse 1. Most surely I say to you, he who does not enter the she uh, sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the, s uh, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And then a little bit later on it says that, let me see, Find it here. Yeah, it says in, in verse uh, 9 there, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find uh, pasture. So, so here, here, you know, he says here, the, the one that enters through the door is the shepherd. And Jesus is the door. So that means that if you enter through Jesus, and what is Jesus doing to the church? He is giving these five-fold ministries. He is giving the apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and the shepherd, the pastor. So, so therefore, it is by him that you can become a pastor. If he calls you, if he is the one that elects you, then you can enter in the, shepherd, uh, the she sheepfold and be a shepherd. But if you are climbing in some other way, you know, you are trying to become a shepherd, you have no calling, but you, are, you want to be a pastor because you, you need a job or... or you think that this is a good career kind of a thing, or, or you like the, the attention, or you like to, you know, get the, you know, whatever. Uh, then all these motives make you into a robber and a thief. Because you are not there for the sheep. You are there for yourself. And then you can never become a true shepherd, a true pastor. So, dear pastor, you have to look closely in the mirror. Look at your motives. Am I a pastor because God has called me, or am I a pastor because I like the tension, I like the, the whatever? If you have the, other, the, the second answer there, then I urge you, and I, I strongly suggest to you, repent and uh, quit as a pastor. Because if you are not called, you can never become a pastor. 
then you are only a thief. Okay, so how to become a pastor? You need a calling. You need Jesus to call you to become it. Okay, then the second thing is you need to have the willingness to lay down your life for the sheep. And we are still in John 10, and we read from verse 11 there. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But the hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lie down my life for the sheep. And, and here is Jesus saying about himself that he lays down his life for the sheep. And of course, he, he did that on the cross. He laid down his life for all of us. And this, this, this willingness in you needs to be there if you are going to be a true pastor. Because then, you know, Jesus is giving of himself to the church when he is giving these five fall ministries. He's giving the, the apostolic side of him to the apostle. He gives the prophetic side of him to the prophet. He gives the teacher side of him to the teacher. He gives the uh, evangelistic side of him to the evangelist. And he gives the shepherd side of him to the pastor. And what is the shepherd side of him? The willingness to lay down his life for the sheep. So, so to become a pastor, you will have this willingness. Or, or at least you have to get it. If, if, uh, but, you know, this is something that God has put into you if you are a true pastor. And what does that mean, to have the willingness to lay down your life? Does that mean that you actually have to, you know, die for them? Probably not in most cases, uh, but might in some extreme cases. But the willingness to lay down your life is to be willing to sacrifice for the sheep. You are willing to sacrifice time. You are willing to sacrifice, you know, your own, you know, free time to, you know, sit and counsel people. And you are willing to, 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 you know, love unconditionally. You know, Jesus on the cross was hanging there because he loved us. You know, he, he loved us so much that he was willing to go on the cross for us. And, you know, there in front of him, of him there were people that were you know, mocking him when he was hanging there. But he was still hanging there for them. And that is, you know, the true shepherd's heart is he is doing this even though the sheep are not always grateful. You know, sheep are sheep. They are mostly stupid. And that is also how it goes with the, the church members, often. They, they are not totally sanctified or listening to the Holy Spirit in all cases. They are into strife, into, you know, rebellion. They are into all kinds of stuff. But you as the pastor have to be there for them, love them, and sacrifice of yourself to them. And if, of course, sometimes, even after you have done this, some of the members might just turn their back on you and leave the church and go somewhere else. And of course, then you can feel like you have sacrificed for nothing, that you have given time, you have given resources, you have given, you know, 
of yourself to them and then they just leave, then you have to have the same heart as Jesus. He is hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So there is no, you know, no thought of revenge, no thought of I have to get my right here or anything like that. Jesus is, have nothing of this. And you as the pastor need to have the same kind of heart. So even when some are you know, just turning your back, their, their back to you, you still have to love them. You still have to, to be there and lay down your life for the church. And of course, this is, this is impossible by ourselves. Our, you know, our flesh is not doing this at all, of course. But God has put into the pastor, into you as a pastor, this heart. And you need to you know, let it grow. He has to, you know, that seed that he has planted into you, you know, by, you know, you being in his presence, being with Jesus, that transform you into this image that he has for you. You know, when you were in, the mo in your mother's womb, he was, you know, you know, sanctifying you to become a pastor. If that is your calling. And then he placed into you some seeds. Seeds of himself. Seeds that shall make you into this perfect pastor. But these seeds, they need, you know, the love and the watering and the, the soil and, and everything that, that makes a, a, a seed grow. And it needs also time. That is, that is why you don't take a, a, a one that is, is saved yesterday and making a pastor today. Because there is a time of growing into every ministry. And, and, and of course, we, when we look for you know, those that God has called into becoming pastors, we see how much of, of this this pastor seed have grown in them. And if we recognize that, oh, here's uh, quite a lot of the pastor function grown into them, then they are ready, and, and we can place them as pastors. Then we recognize what Jesus has done in them. And, and this is a part where we look, you know, how much of rejection can you handle? How much heart do you actually have for the sheep? So that is so important to, to let Jesus just grow in you this shepherd's heart. And how do we grow that? By being with him. We are being transformed by being in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he transforms us into the image of Christ. And what image is that? The image that he has, you know, placed over us when we were in the mother's womb. Then he planted a seed and he wants them to grow into full maturity. That goes for every ministry. But when it comes to the pastor, it's these things that he lets grow in you. Okay. So, so you need to be willing to sacrifice for them. And sacrifice means that sometimes you are not getting anything back from your sacrifice. But you are still sacrificing. Okay? Let's continue. And I, I, I can feel, sense the pain in all the pastors that are listening. And, and yes, it is a tough calling. It's much easier to become, to be called to, the, to become an evangelist. You know, they are just healing the sick, casting out demons, and getting people saved, and then they are forgetting them. 
because they are on the way to the next one that needs to be saved, healed, and delivered. But you are stuck with them. And you are there with, in thick and thin, good and bad, you are there for life. Okay. So, how to come, become a pastor? The next thing is that you need to not have the mentality of the hireling. And, and again, John 10 and verse 12, we read it already, but we can read once more. It says, But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Okay, so this is very important. If you are called to become a pastor, you are not a hireling. And you need to leave the mentality of the hireling behind you if you are going to grow into full maturity of your pastorship. And, and I know that there is quite a many denominations that, you know, that where pastors are like being pastor in a church for two or three or five or ten years and then move on to next. And, and, of course, that is not biblical at all when it comes to the pastor. Because the pastor lays his life down for the sheep. And that means that you are supposed to be stuck there. You are there for life. You are not the hireling. You are not there just to doing a job. You own these sheep. You are there for life. So that means that in the good days, you are there, and they love you. In the bad days, you are still there, and they are loving you maybe a little bit less. But you still, you are there, because you are their pastor. You are not an hireling. And when the, it comes a text against the church, you know, there comes strife in, there comes, you know, different things that are hitting the church, you are still there. Then you are not looking in the, in the ads of, like, is there another, an, a church that needs a pastor here somewhere? Anywhere. You know. There is a lot of pastors that are like that. When tough times come, they are leaving the church the first thing they do. That is to become a hireling. And Jesus is not saying that if you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be a true shepherd, you cannot have this mentality. So, dear pastor, if you have any thoughts about there is greener pastures over there, I want to move to another city. I'm leaving this church because they are so something. Then you have to repent. If you are a pastor, then you are stuck there for life. Because you are supposed to be there in thick and thin, good and bad, always. And not, I'm not talking about you that are actually called to be a teacher, an evangelist, or, or uh, a prophet, or an apostle, but by convenience you are now a pastor because that was the only thing, only option for you, then you will not have this thought. Because all these four will be moving around because they are not just local, sh locally based. But the pastor is locally based. He is for that local church. And I'm not all, all not either talking to you that it's a youth pastor, you know, uh, and, and you are there to be trained and, and so on. Of course, then there is a time when, when God moves you, or, or maybe you are going to be in that church all the time, but 
often he will move you to the place where you actually are supposed to be, you know, serving for life. But I'm talking to you that are the pastor of the church. You are not in hireling. You are the shepherd. And you have to get rid of that mentality that says there is an escape here. There is a, there is a door behind here that I can escape through, you know, if, if things go bad. If my congregation turns into only wolf, then uh, I will escape. No, then you are still stuck there. Because you are there to defend the church. So, anyone that wants to be a pastor? Because this is, you know, often we have a total wrong picture of what a pastor is supposed to be. We think of it as a, oh, this is the most glorious thing in the church. I get all the recognition. I get the power and I get whatever. But no, you get none of that, but you get this. You get to be there, to defend the church, be there to lay down your life, be there to tend them, you know, when they have a bad day. But you also get this glorious crown, this glorious reward from God when you are done with your pastorship. So, he loves the pastors. It says in Revelation that he holds these seven stars in his hand. These seven angels that he later writes to, you know. He writes to the angel of, of, of Thyatira, for instance. That is the pastor of that church. He holds them in this hand. And that is how close Jesus is to the pastor. He, as the the over shepherd, you know, looks for the shepherd because his task is the shepherd's task. And he, he, he recognizes all the sacrifice, all the things that you have to suffer. And, and he holds you so dear, so, so close. So there is a special, you know, relationship between Jesus and his pastors. And, and, and so, so there is, there, yes, it can, looks like it's only sacrifice, but it's not. There's a lot of, of, of upsides to this. There is a lot of good stuff, you know, with the, with the, the closeness of Jesus to your ministry. And, 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 of course, you get to see the church grow into all that it is and so on. But there is also some tough days. And then in the tough days, you are still there as a shepherd. But then you get, you know, you have your rod, and you are there to protect. And you are anointed to do it. So you will always, you know, be standing victorious in everything that comes against you. Because you are anointed to be the shepherd. Okay. So, let's continue. So, so to... to Become a pastor, you need to have a calling. You need to have a willingness to off sacrifice, and you need to get rid of the mentality of the hireling. The next thing we're going to look at is the shepherd's heart. What is the shepherd's heart? First of all, he sees and seeks the one. And, and <clears throat> let's go to Matthew. Matthew 18 and verse 12. What do you think if a man had a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Does he not leave the uh, 99 and, goes and go to the mountain and seek the one that is uh, straying? And if he finds it, as surely I say to you, he rejoices more over the, the sheep that, uh, or that, that 
over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, uh, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So this is, you know, the true shepherd had this heart. You know, that if somebody in the congregation, in the church, is, is struggling, then there is something in the shepherd's heart that, you know, goes out to that person. You, you might not find that in the prophet or the apostle or, or anyone of the other ministries. They, they often have, have a, 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 a much more like, you know, get straight or get out kind of uh, uh, attitude. But the pastor, he had this heart, you know, that longs to, to, to seek those that are struggling and, and help them get on their feet again. And that is something that God has anointed him with. It's something that he has put in there into the heart of the pastor. And, and that is there, you know, to, to help those that are falling, you know, to, to be still standing. And, and therefore the pastor might have, have a very long, you know, a long suffering for his sheep, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, if, if a prophet comes into a church, the prophet is more like, you know, there is sin here. You know, he, he has this, this nose for sin. And, and uh, then he is not like uh, taking, oh, yeah, let's uh, comfort them, let's uh, counsel them for like ages and so on. No, he gets his sword in hand and, and he cuts it down, you know. More like Peter when Ananias and Sapphira is coming, you know, the, they end up dead. That is kind of prophetic type of, uh, uh, of doing it. So, so but, uh, but that is not the pastor's way. The pastor, he would sit down with Ananias and Sapphira and counsel them, you know. Uh, let's talk about this, you know, and, and, and let's see what we can do here. And, you know, let's come to counseling like once a week and we can do this for three years and then we see what's happening. That is more like the, the pastor's heart. He is, you know, there for the long run. He is there. And, and sometimes he can feel a little bit threatened by the prophet and the apostle especially. Because they are quite strong, you know, and, 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 and uh, straight on, you know. And, uh, and of course that can also be a weakness here. But God has put this in the shepherd's heart. And let's go to uh, Psalm 102. And read from verse 13. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time of favor, for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. For your servants take pleasure in her stones. Who's, who are these servants? They are the shepherds. They are the, 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 the pastors that God has put into the house, into his kingdom, you know. And he says, they take pleasure in the stones. And what are the stones? They are the members of the church, these living stones that are supposed to be built up to become this temple of God in the spirit, you know, as it says in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 20 and 20 till 22. And we, we are these stones, you know, every one of us, and, and we are supposed to be built in to become this, this temple. And here it says that the, the servants of God, they have take pleasure in these. And, and of course, when, when a, a pastor sees that people are growing up, getting into the right function, getting into, into, you know, what God have called them to and so on, the, the, the true shepherd, he rejoices over this. But then it also says that he, and they show favor to her dust. 
In the Norwegian it says, they have graves with her dust. So, so and, and what is the dust here? If you smash a stone, you get, you know, the, these smaller stones. And if you crush them till there is nothing left, more or less, you get dust. And here it says that even the dust in the city, these servants are going to show favor to or have grace with. And that means that they are not, you know, just looking at the, the stones that are ready to be put into the building. No, they are also looking at the dust, those that are, 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 in, are in trouble, those that are, are, are Turn down those that are, have have sickness, those that have have problems, those that have have uh, you know things in their lives that need to be restored. And that is the heart of the shepherd, to to see the those that are broken down, and to rebuild them. That is the true shepherd heart, and what the shepherd is all about, is to to have yes they have pleasure with the stones. They will place them on the right place according to the drawing that they get from the apostles. But they also look at the stones that are crushed, that are made into dust. They will also look at those and try to rebuild, you know, to gather this dust, you know, try to make it into a brick or something like that, you know, to, to rebuild it. So, so... <clears throat> So that is, is the shepherd's heart, to, to, uh, to see and seek, you know, the one. So, so you know, the, the, the apostle, he has the, the, the care for the churches, you know, more like, you know, the bishop that is looking at, that he has like 10 churches under him, and uh, and of course, he doesn't know everyone in the local church, but he sees the church as, as a unity. How is that church doing? What, what is, is the strength of that church? What is the weakness of that? What do we need to do here? And so on. And he looks more like, on the, like an oversight. But the, the local pastor is there to look at each and every member to, to see how... How, how is he doing? Who, how is she doing? How is that family doing? And so on. That is on the shepherd's heart. And he longs to see them become these stones that builds the temple locally. Okay, let's continue. Because he is there to protect, as I said. Let's go to 1 Samuel. Chapter 17, verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these world, words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that uh, Ephrahite uh, of uh, Bethlehem, uh, 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 Bethlehem Judah, who, whose name was Yesse, and, uh, uh, and who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three older sons of Yesse and, uh, had gone uh, to follow Saul in the battle. The name of, these, uh, of his three sons who went uh, for battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next Abinadab, and the third, Shamna. Uh, David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David uh, occasionally went and uh, returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and uh, presented himself for the days, morning and, morning and evening, and Jesse said to his son, David, take now uh, for your brothers and Ephra of dried grain. Uh, I can maybe jump a little bit. It's so 
Here we go. Um, I think I have put wrong, um, wrong numbers there. Yeah, we can start from 21, which was probably there I was thinking. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn in up in battle array, uh, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the uh, supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, uh, there, was, uh, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same word, uh, so David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, f fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he, he has come up to def uh, defy Israel, uh, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house uh, ex uh, except exception from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the uh, armies of the living God. And the, and the people answered him in, his, in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard him sp uh, when he spoke to the man. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a, uh, is there not a cause? Uh, then he turned uh, from him toward another, said the same things, uh, and these people answered him as the first one did. Now when the word which David spoke were heard, they uh, reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no, man ha no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And, so and Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine uh, to fight with him, for you are a young, uh, you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to uh, keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and uh, delivered the lamb from the mouth, its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its uh, beard and struck uh, and killed it. Your servant have killed both lion and bear, and uh, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing uh, he has defied the armies of the living God. Okay. So, so here we find David. And of course, David is, is a perfect example here of the shepherd. You know, he is, he is there out with his sheep, and comes not only a wolf, but here is a lion and a bear. A and in both cases, he goes against this, this beast, you know. And first he takes the lamb out of the mouth, and then he kills the lion and kills the bear. And that is, is the attitude that the shepherd is supposed to have. And, and we read, you know, in, in, uh, in John 10, and we're not going to read it again, but... Uh, like Jesus is saying, the hireling, he is running away, but the shepherd, he stays, you know. And, and you as a shepherd, you as the pastor, you are anointed by God to be a good shepherd, to be the defender of your flock, to be the defender of your church. So if the, if the enemy is coming against your church, 
with something to devour the church. And it might be strife, it might be a split, or it might be something, you know, uh, you know, bad economy or whatever, it comes, you know, against the church. Then you as the pastor, you are anointed not only to, you know, stand with the sheep, you know, and, and block the way, but you are, def- you are anointed to attack the attacker. David was not, you know, passive. He didn't just, you know, stand uh, and, and, and uh, had the sheep behind him, you know, to, to defend off the lion. No, he attacked the lion. When the lion had got a sheep in, his, in the mouth, he attacked the lion. And that is how you are supposed to. You are not there to just be the, the cozy little, you know, the, the, the soft-hearted uh, pastor. No, you are there as a shepherd. And you have a rod in your hand. And you are supposed to use that. You are supposed to use the one things that, the things that God has given you. And, and you are anointed to do this. This is part of your shepherd's package. The one that, the, the seeds that God put into you in your mother's womb is that you are anointed to go against the lion and the bear. And, and you need to do this because when you do, the sheep will love you. So if they, if they have, you know, you have, you know, been sacrificing for them and so on, and they are not so, you know, very... Um, appreciative about that. They will be very appreciative when you are killing the lion in front of them. So, so because you are there and you are anointed to this, do this. But if you do the hiring thing, then you flee. And, and then you are just losing, you know. You're losing the fiber of God and the flock is, is scattered. So you need to grow this mentality in you. You need to grow this heart, this heart of David that goes against the lion and the bear. And let's go to Acts 20, and we find a New Testament example here. Acts 20 and verse 25. And indeed, now I uh, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, uh, will see my face no more. This is Pete, uh, Paul, that uh, the apostle Paul, that is gathering the elders or the, the ministers of the church of Ephesus to him. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not uh, shown to, the, uh, to declare to you all the whole go- uh, counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd the church of God, which he uh, purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, uh, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourself, men will rise up, uh, speaking uh, perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for uh, three years I did not cease to warn everyone uh, night and day with tears. Okay, and then we also go to uh, Revelation 2 and we read uh, what Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus after Peter, after, some years after uh, Paul have been martyred, you know. And we read from uh, verse 1 in Revelation 2. 
to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lamp, golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have, uh, yeah, we can stop there. Here, here, first we find Paul saying that there will come some wolves into the church of Ephesus. And, and he even says that some of you will become these kind of wolves, you know. Uh, and he's talking to the pastors and, and ministers in that church. And, and, uh, but he says, you have to. You have to watch against these. And then, you know, this, this happens somewhere in, in like probably like 55 hours after Christ, something like that. Uh, and, and, and then in approximately 90 after Christ or, or something, that, and when, when, uh, when the book of Revelation is, is written, uh, it's at least later, then these things have happened, you know. There have been some that that call themselves apost apostles to, you know, try to draw people towards them, to, you know, create their own small kingdom. And, 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 uh, but then it says that the church have tested them and found them as liars. And then it's, it's you know, uh, when, when, you, when these things happen, you're not just going to sit there, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, yeah, there came somebody and took half my church away. That is not how a, a pastor is supposed to do, you know. The pastor is there to test those that come. And you have to test everyone, you know. Even if they call themselves pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets, or apostles, all needs to be tested to see if they are the right stuff, you know, or are they only there to draw to themselves? If they are there to create their own small group, you know, then you cannot sit there and just tolerate that. Then you have to fend off the wolves. You have to get the wolf out because you are the pastor and you are there to protect the church against these things that want to try to create their own small kingdom. So, so Paul is very, you know, very straightforward with the, these, these shepherds that you have to take your responsibility and, and stay there and defend the church. Okay. So, what is in the heart of the shepherd? It is to be a protector against lions and bears. Okay, and the next thing is that you have to feed the sheep and not yourself. Ezekiel 34. from verse 1 there. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter and the farlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. 
but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So here we find, you know, a very tough word from God to the shepherd of Israel. But this is the same word from God to the shepherd of the church. Who are you feeding? Are you feeding yourself or are you feeding the flock? Again, what is your motive? Why are you a pastor? Are you there to just feed yourself? Are you there to, you know, build your ministry, build your name, create a, a, a network for you? If that is the case, you have to get out. Because you are build, the only thing that you are building for yourself is the wrath of God. That will hit you one day. So this is nothing to be, you know, playing with. You are a servant of the Most High God. And you have to have some fear of God in your heart. And if you do not... And I am your overseer. I will kick the fear of God into you. So, this is so important. We are not playing church. We are the church of the Most High God. And if you are, you are using the church as a building block for yourself, then you will rot in hell. You are in the church to build the church. You are here to feed the sheep, not yourself. If you are thinking of this as my way to become famous, then I hope for your sake that you die early because then you cannot build so much wrath on, on your shoulders. Let's go to First Peter. Read from verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and who and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So here Peter is saying the same thing. Do not be a shepherd because of longing for dishonest gain. But be a shepherd of eagerness because you are there for the flock. You are not there to rule them. You are there to be a shepherd for them. You are there to help them, grow them, feed them, tend to them. That is what you are a shepherd because. So, so, you might think that I am very strict and so on. And I am. But I'm telling you the truth. And I'm telling you out of love for you. Because it will be a bad ending if you are in for the wrong reasons. So, 
So, of course, there's always time to repent. There's always time to do better. To repent means to turn around and do better. Repent is not that you are now feeling a sting in your heart and says, yes, I'm repenting, and then next day do the same. That is not repentance. That is just a temporary conviction. Repentance is to, yes, you feel the conviction of God, but then you turn around and do something else. You do better. So, dear pastor, that are in, the, in for the wrong reasons, repent and do better. Get your motive straight. So, let's go on. Because we talked about, you know, in, in, in uh, Psalm 112, 102, I mean, that the, the shepherd shall have this compassion with the dust, you know, this, this, this uh, the favor with the dust, you know, and, and, and uh, grace with those that, that, you know, are falling, struggling and so on. And that is very important. But there is, you know, in this, there is also a trap. Because the pastor can be so compassionate that he is compassionate with the wrong things. So, and let's go to Revelation again in, in chapter 2 and verse 18. And then it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine breath. I know your words, your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So he is, you know, talking about good things there. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, <clears throat> unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. I will give to you all according to your works. That is it's a word, you know, for those that are, have the... The, the wrong mentality, the wrong, um, you know, motives also, you know. He will give you according to your works, so get your works straight, you know. Um, but anyway, here is, here is about the pastor. And in the, the pastor here in Thyatira, he has gone too far with his compassion. He has gone too far with his willingness to, to give second chances. Because here there is, you know, this, this woman that, that have come in, and she calls herself a prophetess. Probably she was called into a prophetic ministry some time, but then she started to use it into manipulation, into control, and into, to, you know, fear and so on, and start to you know, use this to, to manipulate the other servants into sexual immorality and so on. And of course, when the, 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 the pastor here sees these things, then he shall not allow it anymore. In, in the Norwegian Bible, it says, what I have against you is that you tolerate the woman yet, Jezebel. And that is, you know, probably more like it. Because probably the pastor is seeing this and he is not liking it. But he is still tolerating it. He is, you know, yeah, I see this Jezebel here. Uh, it's not my favorite in the church, but still, uh, it costs too much to take the, 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 the fight. Because, you know, 
this spirit, because Jezebel is a spirit, and it's a spirit that pops its head up in a lot of churches, because it is a very church-going spirit, it's there to, 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 to uh, put out the, the real prophetic flame and instead, you know, get, you know, this, this counterfeit, you know, kind of revelations, you know, dragging in these, these other things, you know. And, 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 and the, the Jezebel spirit is there to take the authority. It seldom have the authority in the, in the first place, but through manipulation, through control, it tries to get a hold on those that have the authority, to bend them into doing her will. And let's go to, to 1 Kings. And chapter 16. And we read from verse 25 there. Oh, actually, no, 29 we can read. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Umri, became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Umri, uh, re, uh, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Umri, did the evil in the, uh, in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. <laughs> that is a good word to have after you. Uh, you, uh, you did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than everyone in bef before you. <laughs> then you are a true kind of guy, you know. Um, and it came to pass that Though it had been a uh, trivial thing for him to walk in the sins, uh, in the sins of Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of uh, Etabal, king of uh, Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Uh, then he set up an altar of Baal in the temple of Baal which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings in Israel who had be, been, uh, who were before him. Yeah. So here we find Ahab and Jezebel. And, and <clears throat> this spirit, oh, actually it's two spirits here. Because... The Jezebel spirit is the dominant spirit that, that needs to, to try to come in and dominate, try to manipulate, try to control, try to, to get her way, you know. But there is, a, there is also a spirit, uh, a, a spirit of Ahab that can come, come with her. And, and that spirit is, is, you know, trying to cling to those that have the authority to make them weak to make them, you know, soft when it comes to Jezebel influence. So, so it's so important as a pastor to be aware of this. And, and you know, if, if you, you know, you see the Jezebel coming, you, you, you might recognize what is happening, but then you might feel that, oh, but I don't want to take the cost here. Because, you know, if, if you try to get the Jezebel out, that will, you know, a Jezebel will always go out screaming. She will never, uh, I say she, it might also be a he, uh, they will not go out with fight, without a fight. So, so and, and therefore there's, a, there's some certain cost, you know, in, in you know, getting rid of her. And therefore, it's, it's, it can be tempting just to, you know, tolerate. Yeah, we try to, yeah, we try to, we know she is a little bit Jezebelic, but uh, yeah, we, we try to contain it here somewhere. And, and yeah, we have some control here. 
But what you are doing is that you are tolerating it. And by tolerating it, it will grow. So, so it's so important as a pastor to take your responsibility as a pastor to get rid of that Jezebel. And now it's, it's important to say that Jesus gave the Jezebel a time to repent, the one in Thyatira. So there is, there, is a, there is a time for repentance for also the Jezebel. You know, when Jehu came to kill Jezebel, it was not Jehu that did the killing, but those servants of her, the Evanos, those that had, had gone, uh, you know, got, that she had cut the manhood off, you know. Uh, they were the ones that throw her out the window. So, and, and those that are under the influence of Jezebel, they are the first offer, the first sacrifice of the Jezebel spirit. So, of course, if they repent, they can throw her out the window. But, uh, so so import, it's important to, to let them have a time of repentance. But if there is no repentance, then there is no more toleration. So then you need to take the fight. And of course, then it's important to, to you know, get a prophet in, because the prophet, you know, is anointed to take, you know, deal with Jezebel. So, so, so you are not alone in this. You are together with the other ministers. And, and, but you need to not, you know, have such a compassion that you tolerate stuff that are not to be tolerated. So be a pastor in these things also. Okay, let's continue. The next part that I'm going to talk about is that the church is not supposed to be pastor-governed nor democratically governed. And what do I mean by that? It means that we are not supposed to be your dictatorship. You are not there to be a dictator for the church. But neither are we a democratic church where, you know, the, the, the church is the one that is leading the pastor. It's, that is very wrong, you know. If, if you go out on the, on the field and look at the shepherds and the, and the sheep, the sheep are not voting where we, shall we go next and leading the, the shepherds to the green pastures. No, there's the shepherd that leads the sh sheep to the green pastures. So, so that is, you know, a very in easy concept. And now I know that I probably are angering uh, some of you because there is a lot of denominations that have this democratic view of the church. Where you find it, I do not know, but uh, uh, at least it's not in the Bible. Uh, so let's go to look at this. Let's go to Ephesians 4.11. Because when you are a pastor, does that mean that you are supposed to lead the church? Maybe, maybe not. Let's look at it. Uh, 4.11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pa pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints and so on. Uh, <coughs> the word here that says pastors in, in this Bible uh, is, the, is the Greek word poimen. Uh, so, of course, why it's translated into a Latin word, uh, which is pastor. Pastor means shepherd in Latin. Poimen is the Greek word for shepherd. So why are we not just using shepherd as 
you know, we use the English word for all the others, other ministers, but uh, for the one is we knew we used pastor. But that is, that is because we, you know, have, have gotten, uh, we, we have uh, inherited this from the Catholic Church, of course. Where they are using pastors as, as the title, of course, and so on. But uh, anyway, uh, but the thing is that poimen means shepherd. But then let's go to First Timothy five. And we read from verse seventeen. Let elders who rule well be counted worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in the word of, and doctrine. Uh, <clears throat> for the scripture says, you shall not muscle an ox while it treads the grain, and the laborers are worthy of his wages. Okay, here it says about the elders who rule and this is another word. It's, uh, it's the word proste, uh, proestomy, uh, something like that. I'm not very fluent in Greek. Uh, and that means the one who rule, or actually more literally, to stand in front. And this word we find also in Romans 12. Uh, uh, and verse 8, which we can quickly read. It says, uh, um, He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads. And that leads here, he who leads, is again proestomy. Uh, so, and, and there is, you know, the, the Greek title of the one that leads the church is proestomy. And, and uh, in Norwegian, we have this title, at least in, uh, 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 in the old Pentecostal movement. Now we probably call them all pastors, but uh, before they called them the forestander, or the one that stands in front. Uh, and, uh, and that is, of course, used this, this word here, because in the Norwegian Bible it says, he, uh, he who is the forestander. Here it says, he who leads. And it means then, of course, he who is the proestomy. And that means that uh, it is, it's not the same word as shepherd. It is two different words here. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you are a shepherd, you are supposed to lead. Because it said, as we read in, in 1 Timothy 5, the elders, and elders here being the ministry gift, not an elected old guy uh, from elected from the church. No, it's the one that the apostles appoint to become, you know, the elders, the leaders of the church. And they are the ministers, the four, you know, specialized ministers that the apostle puts into place in the leadership of a church. They are those that lead among them. They are worthy double honor. That means that some of those are not leading, but still they are shepherds. Still they are there to, you know, shepherd the church, be an elder for the church, and, and, but they are not leading. So it means that, yes, you can be a pastor, but still not lead. But you can also be a pastor and lead. So that is not, you know, it's not necessarily so that the pastor is supposed to lead. But often it is like that. But in any case, let's go to Titus 1.5. It 
It says, for this reason I left you, on, you in Crete. It's, it's Paul speaking to Titus. That you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city that I commanded you. And then it comes with, you know, if a man is blameless and so on, uh, he, he talks about how the, the, uh, the criteria of being these elders that is supposed to be put into the churches. And here we find, you know, the order of the church. And that is the leading apostle being Paul in this case, the one that have planted this network, he has planted the churches, he is appointing some other apostles from his team to become bishops over a certain area. In this case, Titus, which is becoming the, the bishop of Crete, the island of Crete. On the island of Crete, Paul and Titus have already been working there, establishing churches. And, and then Paul is leaving him to set the things in order. And that is, is a very apostolic part of ministry, to place into order how things is supposed to be in the churches. And in this, he says, appoint elders. See who has the potential here, who is, has a calling on their life, and put them in to become the shepherds of the local churches. But still he is saying to Titus, you shall stay in Crete until I send somebody to replace you so you can come to me. If you read on. Uh, so, so it's important for Paul to have some of his team staying on Crete as a bishop. So here we find a kind of an order in this, 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 uh, this structure of the church is that, yes, there is a local pastor, there is a local shepherd that is appointed by a local bishop to, to you know, tend to the local church. But he is also responsible to, toward that bishop that, again, is responsible to the leading apostle of that network. So there is, there is, a, there is a, 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 a chain of command, in a way, here. Uh, but these, these shepherds that are there to be forestanders, to be these proestomies, you know, in the church, they have responsibility for that local church to lead it. But they had to lead it according to those plans, the, 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 the authority that they have been given from the, the apostle that have planted the church. You know, when God gives the apostle the drawing for the church, that is, or, or the vision, you know, that is the mandate that the local pastor then after builds according to. If you read in, in 1 Corinthians 3, you will find that Paul is saying to, that yes, I have laid the foundation as a, uh, a master builder. The word is actually architecton, which is, you know, you can hear the word archit uh, architect from, which is, you know, but it means master builder. Uh, and, uh, and of course, here, and then he says, I have laid the foundation as a, as a master builder. Uh, and and uh, uh, somebody shall continue building upon that foundation. But that those have to see to how they are building. They cannot build, you know, by them, their own, uh, you know, whatever they like to do. You know, I want to build this as a, you know, let's build a big tower here or let's, you know, build uh, something else. Let's, let's widen the doors here. And no, there is a drawing. And the local shepherd have to, you know, build according to that vision that the church had been given originally. You cannot alter that. That is not within your mandate to do. Yes, you are set to lead, 
the building process. But you cannot build whatever you want. You have to build what the original drawing said, the word from God to that church. If that is that you are supposed to be a prophetic church, then you as the local pastor have to open the door for the prophetic. If it is that you are supposed to be a shelter for the homeless, then that is what you are supposed to do. You have to get hold of, you know, the original calling to the church, the original word from heaven, the one that, the one word that laid the foundation. Because what is the foundation for a building? It is, you know, the boundaries for that building. If you're building a skyscraper, you need to have a certain foundation that can hold a skyscraper. But if you are building a small cottage, you need a totally different foundation. You cannot place a skyscraper on the foundation of a cottage. And if you place a, uh, a cottage on the foundation of a skyscraper, you have you know, not fulfilled that foundation. You know. So, so it's, it's important to see that if, if the, the founding apostle of that church had a vision, then that is your mandate to build upon as the local pastor. <coughs> Okay, let's continue. God gave four specialists and one with oversight. Uh, and uh, Ephesians 4, 11, we don't read again, but, uh, you know, apostle is the one with the oversight. He is true to, he's faithful in all God's house, it says, in both in, uh, in Hebrews 3 and, and also in in. in, uh, in uh, Book of Numbers, I think it is. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it, he is true or faithful in the whole house of God. He has the overview. But these other four, the, the prophet, teacher, evangelist, and the pastor, they are specialists. They are very much true to what God has given them. But that is, is, is a limited field of operation. The prophet is very, very good to be a prophet, but he is not good at all if he is put to be a pastor. Because he has no pastoral bones in him, you know. He is, he is the sharp sh sword, you know, and so on. And, 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 you know, he's not there with full of compassion and so on. And, and vice versa, a, a pastor is not a good prophet because he is, he is not called and equipped for being that. And, and so, and that is the, the point here. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. And we read from verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the foot says, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is, the, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an, ear, an eye, where would uh, be the hearing? If the whole uh, were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seems to be weaker and necessary are necessary. And those member, members of the body which we think to be le uh, less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And uh, our unpresentable parts have, uh, have greater modesty. 
But our uh, presenting parts have no need. But God composes, composed the body, uh, having given greater honor to the part which lack it. And uh, that uh, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member sh suffers, all the members suffers with it. And if one member is honored, uh, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. And God have appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, uh, helps, administration, various of tongues. So here, here we find, you know, this, this picture of the body. And, and it, it is, God have made us into one body. And when we talk about, you know, these ministry gifts that Jesus has given to the church, we are not there to, you know, fulfill the whole task alone. We are not, you know, if the prophet is the eye, he cannot say, I don't need the feet. I don't need the evangelist. I don't need those that are going out with the gospel. Because I am here just to see, you know. Then, then the body will suffer. And that is also how it is with the pastor. If, if, if you think that you are there just to, to rule alone, then you are mistaken. You are there to rule together with the, the ministry team. With those that Jesus gave to the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one that rules the church, not you. And he gave to the church five ministers so that he could govern the church through these five. And that means that when he is, you know, talking to the church about something that, you know, regards the prophetic, he will speak to the prophet, not to the pastor. And when it comes to, when it comes to the compassion, when it comes to, you know, caring for, for the church and so on, these things he will talk to the pastor about. And when it comes to, you know, evangelism and, and let's go out and, and win souls and so on, he will speak to the evangelist. Because they are the ones that are anointed for this. They are getting revelation according to their ministry. And then, of course, when you in the leadership team are listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to all these different ministers, then you get the full picture of what God is saying to the church. But if you as pastor, you know, insist of, no, I'm the pastor, I have the only say in this church, then you first of all are stupid. Then second of all, you are unbiblical. Because you need to listen to what God is saying through these other ministers because they are set in the church to lead the church just as much as you are. But then you say, yeah, but if I'm the forestander, if I'm the proestomy of the church, I'm not supposed to lead them. Yes, you are. But not as a dictator, as the one that is leading according to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And therefore, in the, in the leadership team, you are supposed to recognize the Holy Spirit talking through these different ministers that are placed in the leadership. You have all the Holy Spirit in you. And when the Holy Spirit is speaking through an evangelist, the prophet recognizes it. And also the pastor and all the others, you know. They recognize the Holy Spirit. They recognize the anointing that is floating. And that is how God is leading the church. He's leading through his anointing, through his, you know, word that he's speaking, his revelation. We are supposed to be led by revelation. 
And that is, you know, a, a people without vision goes astray. But we are supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. So in your leadership, dear pastor, get in the other minister. Try to get one of each at least. Put them into the office of a prophet, office of an evangelist, office of a teacher. That is to give them a governmental role in the church. That shows that you are not there leading just by your own accord. No, you are leading by letting the Holy Spirit speak to you through somebody else. But then you have the last word. Just like Jacob, you know, the... the the James, it says in, in the English version. James, the brother of Jesus, who was the, the pastor or bishop of, of the church of Jerusalem. You know, in the apostolic meeting, you know, when, when there was great strife between Paul and Barnabas and, and the, uh, the Judaized in the, on the other side, then Peter, you know, as the leading apostle, said, this is how we do it. And then James was rising up and confirming it, having the last word, as the local bishop or pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. That is how it is, you know. Yes, we recognize what the Holy Spirit is saying to others, but as the forestander, as the poestomy, then you have to, yes, this is what we do. You have the last word. But not as a dictator, but as a leader of the team. Submit to one another and under the mighty hand of God. Let's close with this. Let's go to First Peter. First Peter in uh, chapter five, verse one. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, nor for dishonest pay again, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with hum humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore humbles, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time. So here we find, you know, the, the, how this is supposed to be. Humble yourself under each other, submit to each other. That is how this is supposed to be. You are not set as a ruler, but we are supposed to submit to each other. So when the Holy Spirit is speaking to one of the other ministry gifts, you as a pastor need to submit to what the Holy Spirit is saying through that person. And, and, and there, you know, it says, it concluded here that we all shall submit to the mighty hand of God. And that is because Jesus is the one that leads the church, not us. Not even if we are pastors or apostles or whatever. We are here to submit to him. Okay. But it's at the same time, dear pastor, you have to be bold. You have to lead. You have to take the leadership. So this is it's not me saying that you should submit and, and be under the church or whatever like that. 
and, and whatever they vote they, that you should do. No. You are placed to lead. You know, it says, you know, that you should lead with eagerness and, and, and so on. And, and let's just read the last thing here now in, in the Hebrews 13. And verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls and those who must give and, and those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would not be, for that would be unprofitable for you. So here it says, you are, you have to rule. And, and, and they shall submit. So, so, uh, so be bold in you being a pastor, you being the, the fourth standard or whatever you are. So, so I'm not saying that you should now you know, lay, lay down all your authority. No, you have authority, but not as this, this kind of type of tyrant. You are there leading together with the other ministers. You are leading the team, but it is the team that leads. But still you have to be bold in what you are, what God has called you to. So, dear pastor, be bold and be a good shepherd. Have a shepherd's heart and the right mentality. So, Father, I just pray for each and every one that have listened to this. And I pray for those that have a calling to become pastors. Father, just encourage them. Encourage them into take the steps that is needed to become pastors. Create in them the shepherd's heart. And, and let them grow into maturity. Let the, the seeds that you have planted in them grow so that they become pastors of a after your heart, Father. And, and, and we just pray in Jesus' name that you come with your anointing. Let them be bold when there comes a text against the church. Let them stand firm in Jesus' name. And Father, let them also see the other ministers. Let them open their hearts for what you are speaking to them through others. And let them create a good team around themselves and so that the church can be fivefold and get into all that you have for the church in Jesus' name. We just pray your blessing, your favor, and protection over each and every one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And I hope you uh, got something from this, even if I'm a little bit strict sometimes. Uh, and, and, uh, and if you like to find, you know, the other parts of the School of Ministry, it's easiest to do that on the, on the YouTube site that we have, New Apostolic uh, Network TV, New Life Apostolic Network TV. Uh, and there you can easily find the different, uh, the different uh, uh, topics, and this, the playlists and so on, uh, and, and uh, easily find it. In, on the Facebook site, site, you have to scroll for ages to come to the bottom and so on. So, so this is an easier way to do it. So please subscribe and follow us there in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we see you next week.